You're listening to Tune Dig, a podcast for music lovers. Before we get started, we had a little bit of an audio snafu with Kyle's mic. So you might hear a little bit difference in audio quality as opposed to hopefully what you're getting used to over time. Uh, We figured it was worth pointing it out because we try really hard to make sure that the audio quality is as high as possible. We know you listen to enough podcasts that are... uh, well, terrible sounding, and we try to be one of the ones that maybe aren't, at least quite so often. And so even though we don't have our normal studio set up, uh, we're trying really hard to make sure everything comes through clear. We decided to roll with this audio instead of re-recording it just because we thought the conversation was great and organic as is. We'll be back on it with the following, and we'll make sure that both of our mics are on the right way. Thank you very much for indulging me on that last one going on the magic carpet ride with me. I know I'm a little bit like a dog chasing cars. If I may extend into another analogy, um, I am going to uh, tie the rope around my waist while you go way down the rabbit hole, and I'll just be up here if you need me. Um, I love the specificity of what we're about to get into, and I think a very specific aspect of this podcast that I'm very proud of is how much we love heavy music like that that's that's where we overlap the most tightly as friends and music fans um (laughs) right (laughs) how to goth um but you are uh to quote community streets ahead of me on this thing and are constantly teaching me stuff and um what we're about to get into, I think, is so cool. Like, if I were trying to explain to someone who you are um, and, like, the quickest way to your heart and, and unlocking friendship with you, this weird little thing is kind of it. So I think this was one of the first ideas for a Tune Dig Radio episode that we had. <laughs> Yeah, you said, what if we did prompts instead of an album? And I went, what if we did one for HMT? <laughs> yeah. I think it went even earlier than that where it was yeah. like, I I want to do like trap them, but I don't necessarily want to devote a whole episode to it. You know, if we do like a converge and some other heavy stuff, some of it gets to be repetitive. Like, yeah. OMG, I love Kurt Ballou. Um So this was a good like side door entree into that. Um, so Cliff, tell us about the heavy metal two pedal and what we can expect from this episode, especially for someone who may not consider themselves a fan of heavy music. I would love to. <laughs> so today we're going to be it's like the prompt that you always wish you got at a bar, <laughs> you very specifically. And now, now it's here. Now that we can't go to bars, here it is with a, with a harsh light on us. It's like the TV episodes that ends in a debate competition, and you get your last prompt, and you're like, yes! <laughs> so, did, yeah. I just, did I just black out? It's just, I have no idea what I just said. Yeah, so today I'll be talking to you about the four knobs that changed heavy music, and I'm not talking about Metallica. Thanks. So, <laughs> that, so tell, tell me you woke up in the middle of the night and had that exact thought. <laughs> Like, well, I know how we're dropping into the half pipe of this episode. I pulled over to the side of the road when I got it. Yeah. Uh, so, like, this will be great not only to be dorky, but because it's it's such a good going all the way down into some really specific thread to tie all these things together that you'd never know about unless you cared about all the layer of details to get to it. Not just like production in general, but like I'm a person who emailed Kurt Ballou once and was like, how do I do this thing that I hear? Like, I know that I won't be able to act on your answer and I still just want to know, will you tell me? And and he did, uh, which was awesome. But so this one particular guitar pedal, uh, was honestly like a piece of shit is like the story of this pedal. Um, it was first produced in Japan in the mid eighties from 83 to 88. Uh, and then they swapped it over to Taiwan. Uh, and this is how, you know, it's an interesting musical thing, right? They, they moved from manufacturing it in Japan to manufacturing it in Taiwan, changed nothing about any of it, 
but everyone wants the Japanese one because it sounds better. Even though you can easily find videos on YouTube with people who are being like, no, definitely not. These are the same things. Still, it's now it's got all this culture to it. Um, and it's, it's such a great example of like music memeing, like, <laughs> like introducing entirely new subgenres. And like metal is already a genre that splinters into a million meme based genres anyway. Like, um, we will briefly touch on like some of the branches of metal that go into like gore and violence and stuff. But like even that itself is just a meme and all violence and gore in that branch of metal anyway is just out memeing the last person to meme this thing because for funsies basically. Um, so we take this garbage guitar pedal um, that was uh, that was marketed by Boss towards people who wanted to emulate the Marshall Stack sound of hair metal bands. <laughs> and it did such a garbage yeah, job. Yeah, first half <laughs> it did such a garbage job. But I love that. It was uh, like, take the great thing from the worst example of it that we could possibly use. Not yeah. the Marshall sound of Jimmy Page, right. but the Marshall sound of rat. Right. <laughs> So, so, I mean, and just to give an idea of it, because I mean, we could go super deep on the science and by God, I'm going to spare everybody that. But like, just to give an example, like there are four knobs on this thing, right? Uh, and one of them is a distortion knob. Like verifiably between the numbers three and eight, nothing changes in the pedal. 100% verified. The knob doesn't even work appropriately. Um, and so it's got these weird little things that you would now call a nuance, but back then was just a broken, crappy pedal that no one wanted. Uh, and so, but it, as with all forms of anything like this in music, it comes from not only a pure accident and a terrible marketing ploy, but also, do you know who popularized this pedal to begin with? I only just found out and I'm very excited for you to share. David Gilmore from Pink Floyd. <laughs> in the mid 80s with the weirdest sounding album, like when the yeah. 70s dudes started leaning into 80s sounds, it was all weird. Yeah. You know, like Phil Collins and Peter Gabriel and everything like that from the mid to late 70s. Uh, Jimmy Page and Robert Plant are also good examples. Um, like when I read that in an overview of the HM2, I was like, N no. <laughs> what could it pop? What could. David Gilmore doing something entombed made popular. Like, what could that even sound like? And, yeah. and then you hear it and you're like, oh, I get it. I don't like it, but I get it. it he did it on his solo record and then the one Floyd record from the late 80s. Right? Yeah, About Face and a Momentary Lapse of Reason. Right. Yeah. Um, but, like, it, it's a good example, too, of it, some people continue to use it essentially as, like, a boost pedal. Mm -hmm. So you, like, you you tweak with all the knobs that make for the terrible garbage. I did love, though, that he said specifically, I had a fuzz or a distortion, yeah. but I didn't like some of the ruder edges of that. And yeah. this actually tamped that down. Yeah. But then the way it got popular to be used was, like, the opposite of that. It was, like, I want all the ugliness from this thing. So that was... That was really interesting. I, I love the, the story of this for me is like the creativity that comes from deliberate misuse or like anti something. -ing. Um, so I know we'll get into that. Yeah. And so, so this pedal existed naturally, you know, I don't know if David Gilmore was paid or not uh, to advocate for it, but I mean, especially in the eighties, like that's when guitar companies ramped up guitar magazines with full page ads with sponsored players with like signature guitar, signature amp, signature pedal. Right. So everybody could push everything like, you know, Van Halen was pushing the EVH stuff with, like, so it was just like full on, like the economy is going up. Kids have money. Like they learned they're, they've watched, they're watching MTV now. They want to emulate stuff. Uh, and so you've got a bunch of this stuff. And so like, as with a lot of things that came out in the eighties, there's really no sense of quality one way or another from all the stuff that was being produced. Uh, so, but what happened was I would until this decade, I would have said the eighties were the worst decade ever, but I don't know. We're giving it a run. Yeah. We're going to give it a run for its money on the first year of it of the decade. Cause oh, wow. we had, yeah, we had shitty actor presidents and all that. Let's not, we've done that already. That's in the past. Let's talk about heavy metal. 
Let's bang our heads. <sighs> yeah, let's send messages to our future selves. I really wish that we had gotten like a six pack of PBR tall boys and just crushed them and gotten them all in the carpet here. Cause like that's, I miss that vibe. We haven't done live music in a very long time and I'm barefoot and I just want cigarette smoke smell all in this room. Nothing smells bad anymore and I miss it. Yeah. Oh man. Just stop showering at your house. That's all you got to do. <laughs> I've, I've tried. I can't get there. <laughs> Uh, so, okay. So like with a lot of classic, like someone figured out some weird angle of music, like honestly a lot like sampling in the sense of finding a weird version of something and then creating something totally new out of it. The whole HM2 resurgence basically just came out of just dead, poor Swedish kids who were able to get a hold of these pedals because Boss is making a ton of them, right? One and two, they're not popular, uh, so no one really wants them. So you can get a hold of them, right? And there's there's plenty of story to be told about cheap, solid-state PV amps and all this stuff um, for a lot of the black and death metal that came out of late 80s and early 90s, especially in the Nordic area. Um, but so there was there was a band called Nihilist. Uh, the, the basis of Nihilist becomes a guitarist uh, in what would eventually become the band known as Atheist. Uh, and so he's he's playing guitar, uh, which, you know, switching between bass and guitar was, uh, you know, a thing that didn't matter at that point because everything sounds like garbage in this entire genre of music on purpose and for fun. Um, so so he, a joke that I still don't understand the punchline of, by the way, there is no punchline. That's what's awesome about it. There's no point. There's no funny. It's not satire. The, the zero funny. Uh, so it's an extremely European sensibility. Yeah, that's that's. I, I feel a lot of camaraderie with it. The oh. joke is that you are the joke. <laughs> the joke is you think the joke exists. <laughs> <laughs> like a your god. So. So inevitably what happens, and uh, I can say this is somebody who spent 15 years trying to understand guitar stuff, when you don't actually know what you're doing and you don't have the energy to figure out how to do it correctly, you just start jacking around with knobs until you get something funny. <laughs> so That's what she said. Oh, boy. So thank you, I'll Kyle. Try to, I'll try to stay off that track for this one. Thanks. That's what she asked. So... Turn all turn all the knobs to ten on this pedal. Dime them. I mean, which is such a cool phrase. It's like say it and flick a cigarette. It's so in good. The studio. Dime them all. And it, but because of the way that this pedal is built, it sounds so different from every other combination of the knobs that it creates this other sound that it was definitely not supposed to be making sure. at that point, right? So then you're taking. This HM2 cheap pedal with a cheap guitar piped through a cheap solid state PV amp. And all of a sudden you've got this thing that sounds like the subwoofer is being ripped off of whatever cabinet it's in. It doesn't sound right at all. And that meant it was perfect for what they needed. So it did something totally different. They started using it for its abrasive properties. Uh, and it became known as the Swedish sound essentially for a lot of this music. Um, but I think the, the thing that we want to now like double down on is it wasn't just ha ha, nothing matters. Uh, my guitar tone doesn't matter. Actually, they started figuring out the tone that this pedal is producing actually leaves a really different kind of sonic register and palette in the music itself right. to where you can hear different things now uh, in a way that, like especially metal from that time period, I mean, it was all just slammed into the mid-range. Yeah. Uh, and it sounded super muddy. And ironically, this pedal, because it was overly distorting everything, actually kind of emptied out that space a little bit and left some room for articulation. Again, it sounds like a joke, but like it ended up leaving room for articulation in a way that made metal actually more bearable. You could hear some of the parts. And if you talk about it in terms of sonics, it it like the sound of this pedal is indescribable mm -hmm. when it's true. Like to call it the chainsaw pedal doesn't really go all the way there. It's interesting that the sonic signature pushes out the mids because it's like the mid of the high is where you get the buzz and the mid of the low is where you get the like chuggy part. Mm -hmm. 
And I know we'll talk about this later, but it, 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 this first block of songs I love because it get, it like prefaces it in the right way. It doesn't sound all the way right until you put all the right dressings around it. Yeah. Right. And it was the third or fourth song. I think it was the carnage song where there's incredible low end for the first time. Yeah. And you're like, Oh, I get it now. Cause you start with this mayhem song and it's just, it's almost like, um, white balancing for your ears with this thing. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, eh, I don't, I don't love the sound of this necessarily. This is that black metal shit that he's always trying to get me to listen to. <laughs> um, but it's such a perfect setup. So I'm, I'm really grateful that you, you did it this way Yeah. because when you get into the, the stuff that actually starts sounding objectively good, you're like, Oh my God. I mean, it's, it hits you like nothing else can. Yeah. So like, so in this first block, like you've said, uh, we we touch on the early '90s for the most part, uh, but I wanted to like back up just before people started figuring out the four dime setup of this pedal, so that you can hear the progression of it. And I've tried to organize this playlist; it's not perfect, but I've tried to organize it in a way where you can really feel like almost like a curve the way that it starts being produced, it's almost like you start to notice it in the mix. And then over time, song after song, you realize people are actually producing around this guitar tone. It becomes a consequential part of the entire mix on purpose later. Uh, And then would, as we'll cover in a bit, would spider web out into very intentionally creating nuanced versions of this otherwise very unnuanced sound, which is rad. <laughs> so, uh, so kicking off with life eternal from mayhem, um, even though it came out in 94, which is a little bit after some of the kind of canonical Swedish buzzsaw stuff started happening. Um, I wanted to, to bring it out because Euronymous played in this band uh, before, so this was like right before he was very famously murdered, <laughs> uh, which is, again, a very black metal thing to talk about. But this was sort of before the culture had totally absorbed itself in this is the only way to use this pedal. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what was funny is the way Euronymous used it in Mayhem in this song is like the only only other way that this pedal is ever used, which is in combination uh, with another overdrive pedal. So he was using an SD1, uh, but I've seen people use a DS1 and other things like that. So where you don't you don't dime everything on the HM2, but you're either using it as like a boost after an overdrive or a boost into one. Uh, and it creates this just like ridiculous sound that then goes through like a really tiny crappy amp. Um, but it's it's a great example of how black metal would actually play a little bit of a role in the way that this sound would kind of shape up, even though what it would come to be used for was pretty specifically death metal instead. Uh, And for anyone who's like, cool, black metal and death metal are going to be the main categories of this thing. I have no (laughs) idea how to tell them apart. That's fine. Listen, listen kind of closely to the first couple of songs. You'll start to hear the the rhythm for the most part start to shift. And then the guitar riffs start to shift around the drums to where eventually death metal becomes, it's just groovier. Uh, it's got a kind of meaty riff to it. Whereas black metal is content to just play really steady blast beats for eight minutes and be done. Um, but starting with the mayhem song, like just after three minutes in, he kicks off into a riff that starts to show you how you could use this pedal to get some extra articulation out of the guitar, uh, because it's been three minutes of muddy up until that point. And then you're starting to pick something out, but it's not just louder than everything else. It's the guitar and the bass playing the same riff, but it takes on like a totally different kind of attitude at that point in the song. And to me, it's just a good example again of like kids just tweaking around with how stuff works and stumbling upon something. So, so out of mayhem, I also included the only Dark Throne record that actually included anything related to this particular tone. Uh, Dark Throne otherwise prides itself on being extremely pure black metal, <laughs> um, but Grave with a View uh, was part of this record that. Uh, 
where they they definitely borrowed the Swedish chainsaw sound, produced the whole record that way. Uh, and it's like, it's very straight up buzzsaw and then they never tried to do it again. But it was interesting because it was right there. It's like January 91. So it's like just after Left Hand Path is all coming out. So like, it's a good example of like the, the moment of this weird little sound was so seismic in this little area of the world that even bands who prided themselves on not being like other bands tried it yeah. because it was so immensely popular immediately. Uh, it started gaining a bunch of steam. So out of Dark Throne, then we actually, now we're lining back up with the traditional like Swedish chainsaw path of things. So Dark Recollections from Carnage uh, came out in January of 90, just before Left Hand Path, which is again like, the canonical example of all this. But this Carnage record is what kicked off the producer at Sunlight Studios basically saying, oh, this is a thing. We're going to start doing this with bands because... Amazing, by the way, that the studio for this was called Sunlight. Right? (laughs) There is no joke. Don't look for it. (laughs) But, um, like, I I think one good example from this song is, again, about three minutes in, uh, there's a guitar solo, and it shows how... In, you know, in the Mayhem song, you start to get more articulation out of the guitar part. In the Carnage song, it shows you how, again, you can actually drop back and do the opposite with the same guitar tone, and you can put a solo on top of it, and there's room for everything uh, without dropping volume or dynamics. And so it, st- it starts to move you in this direction of, like, if you're willing to listen to some pretty abrasive music really intentionally, you can start to hear how if someone listens to stuff like this every day for their whole life, everything becomes splitting hairs, right? Mm -hmm. And by this time, even just in early 90s, there's people going, oh, I can make room for this ridiculously uh, played guitar solo in the midst of this ridiculously played guitar riff through this tiny amp, and I can leave room for articulation for it for the 17 people who will appreciate it at that time. Um, So... So then the producer's picking it up at Sunlight Studio, uh, and then, you know, now we're in classic Entombed land. And this is where pretty much anyone would bring you if we start talking about this pedal anyway. Um, so, you And know, by the way, if, if someone was like, to me, what is your favorite metal band? Um, I, I don't know that it's the exact right answer based on data, but I always reach for Entombed first because they're the toughest and coolest metal band, like, that there ever was and <laughs> left hand path and Wolverine blues are still like they go harder than just about any, I would put it up against anything, man. Like those records hit so fucking hard. I, I can't believe that they existed at that time when nothing else before it was. Yeah. And to me, whether that interests anybody or not, like those moments to me are the things that fascinate me about music. Like something gets in your blood and you're like, no, no, no. I want to sound like this forever. And I want other people to emulate it. Um, So, and I think think it's more like the Johnny Cash thing. It's like, we'd play faster if we could. (laughs) They, it, it just, it clicks with you at like a DNA level. And you're like, oh, this is my thing. Yeah. Now. Yeah. And so, so Entombed is using this. They're still going through, just like, I mean, this is an actual quote um, from the guitarist that recorded then. I used a worthless Ibanez guitar, a small PV combo amplifier, and a Boss HM2 pedal. Basically, there are two Boss heavy metal distorted guitars, one in each speaker, and then a DS1 in the middle. So they're just like, they're using the HM2, they're recording some different takes of guitar, and then they're just spreading it out across the speakers and trying to make a wall from nothing. Um, and this initial entombed record, uh, the, the left hand path, it it gives you an example too of like, there's some, in my opinion, there are some places even in this song, abnormally deceased where they, they leave the sustain for just a minute and it drones just long enough. And to me, it actually starts to sound like, uh, listening to Matt Pike live where you're like, okay. Everyone who cares about going to shows and listening to guitar is like, take a minute. Imagine and remember what it felt like to be in a room where the guitar player was turned up way too loud. Okay. (laughs) And you're there and it's so much noise that it starts to distort in your own ears. Yeah. Crackles. Yeah. Yeah. And like, 
it sort of represents the way that HM2 was able to push things in recording to that level without you having to turn up the volume itself. Like it feels like the wheels are about to come off the whole thing. Um, and so like even the entombed production on this record is a little bit more like tinny, almost more high pitched yeah. when you compare it to like the Carnage song that came before it. But you can see producers trying to figure out what's the slight tweak that works for every band and every song. And so it's just such a good jumping off point. So, you know, this is this is a, a four song kickoff to the whole playlist. Mayhem and Dark Throne were from Norway. Carnage and Entomb were from Sweden, both using HM2 in like totally brand new ways effectively in the early 90s through black metal and death metal respectively. Uh, and then as you'll see, we'll... As, as everyone will see, uh, kicked off uh, a thing that has only gotten more powerful as it's gone along. Yeah. So in the last episode, we talked about how much was unfamiliar to the person that didn't make the playlist. And I knew 50% of this um, at the gates exclusively because of you. Yeah. Because you were like, this is one of the best metal records of all time. And Disfear out of the uh, six degrees of Converge, um, one of my favorite Converge Orbit projects is Doom Riders, uh, Nate Newton's like biker band, and they did a split with Disfear. Mm-hmm. Um, and as a result of that, I got really into D beat, like a really specific kind of offshoot <laughs> of this thing. Um, it's basically like if you um, took Motorhead and like pumped it full of meth, um, which makes it sound terrible, but it's super rad. No, I'm into it. Uh, but the the quiet MVP of this thing for me is this Bloodbath song and the band Bloodbath. Um, I like less and less all the time now. I'm finding myself like actively seeking out metal for metal sake type bands, and I don't ever know how to make the distinction of like <laughs> this is a tight heavy band versus this is a band trying to be a metal band. Um, but the occasional thing, because of that, the occasional thing like a bloodbath will get past me. And I was listening to the playlist after you put it together, and I had my holy shit in the grocery store moment with headphones where I was like, this is the best new, ah! and I listened to it 10 times in a row. Um, but, you know, I, I think this is, uh, it would be easy for me to say some of the later stuff is my favorite, but because this little combo of things sounds so good and was so new to me i think this wound up being my favorite of the playlist where where this is like really kind of the tipping point where it starts to they really start dialing it in so to speak oh yeah and this is probably four of the kind of weirdest or almost most disparate 
uh, especially of And I the, think that's what I like about it. Yeah, it, because it starts to explore, like I titled the section of the outline, what if we also produce the music, though? <laughs> like, be, because, you know, we talked about... That there was, was one time we... There was a band called The Showdown, a metal band, and their there first was. record... That, yeah, there was. It's night Arguably, band. yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, I will never forget, like, there are these minuscule musical moments that I don't know why they stick with me, but they do. But I remember you giving me that record and being like, it's an amazing metal record, despite the fact that it sounds like they recorded it in the back of a moving car. And I've never forgotten that descriptor. <laughs> and block one has a little bit of that. Uh, yeah. Why did they record it in a station wagon <laughs> um, or a station wagon inside of a barn? Uh, and then this is like, okay, that's stupid. Like, let's like make it sound good, guys. So, yeah. So this section is a relief to me. <laughs> so, uh, so just to read out the four um, of Darksome Origin from Edge of Sanity, which came out in '94. Blinded by Fear from At the Gates came out in '95. Uh, and then we'll jump forward a little bit to to the Disfear uh, song, Live the Storm. From 2008, uh, and then the the Bloodbath record you mentioned came out in 2005. I picked Eaton off of it uh, for some specific reasons, but like now, I like I really want to double down. If there's one human being on Earth who's willing to like listen really specifically to these songs and hear what we're talking about, I want to tell you what to listen for because these rule. Um, like you, like the so the Edge of Sanity song. They started to get to where they could produce the articulation and use noise gating or whatever else to give it a quick unsustained stop and like edge of sanity will stop mid song and go in a totally different direction <laughs> right so they'll just like shift into a different rift or a riff and it's it's sharp with the asian 2 guitar tone in a way that other metal distortion doesn't really do mm-hmm. um, because the the articulation on the very earliest part of the note is sort of what starts breaking the HM2 uh, into its own category. And so you can really hear it here uh, on on this particular song from Edge of Sanity. And then like around three minutes and 30 seconds into it, they start building up into this, uh, this perfect riff. Uh, but like, Again, just a, a great example of like production and musicality starting to improve around each other, um, because the, that first block of bands we talked about, I mean, they they sort of prided themselves on not being good on purpose. It was a culture, and like this is and a collect like the Ramones for murderers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> murderers and pacifists are the only thing that make up that part of the world, um, and then. So then we get to At the Gates and like Slaughter of the Soul is just like at least a top 10 heavy music record. We talked about Illmatic on the previous episode and I think of they're kind of from around the same time period where it's like they there's been there was nothing like it before it and there's been nothing really truly like it since. Yeah. It just came so out of nowhere. It's also the only record where they use the papyrus font on the cover that I would ever recommend to any human being alive. Um, but good, good God, is that a tight record? Oh, and so and, and you, you have two things. Um, you have the tone, right? And you have the thing that they do with the HM2. Um, also played through a PV solid state amp. Uh, I just can't emphasize enough how shitty a PV is. Uh, but, you know... They are what would be described, and I hate getting into genre descriptors like this. I actively resist them at every turn, but it, what would be described as melodic death metal. Yeah. Because, and it, like, I, I appreciate that genre term because it's the best way to describe what they do from a guitar songwriting perspective. Yeah. Like, they do the kinds of riffs and leads that you find yourself humming and singing and not in like a beatles way, um, that it's so tough and it's also so memorable because of these guitar lines. It has that edge, but it also has the kind of melodic core. Is yeah. It's so singular to them and their sensibilities. Right? <laughs> oh. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. And like that's what I wanted to call out too is like, because at the gates took it in in a relatively more melodic direction again it's starting to bring out 
like it's starting to break with the original meme of the pedal. The thing that they're keeping is including it with these really weird buzzsaw settings, but what they're learning to do is put it into different contexts where it actually fills the rest of it out. This is also the first block where, and then you'll see this as we go into a section of exclusively Kurt Ballou produced songs. But the thing you need to start to see here is that they started to figure out how to mix the vocals. Vocal and guitar mixture in metal is just awful to this day. Yeah. Um, and it's make or break. Yeah, like 70% of metal records are just like mixed awfully, right? Um, and to so the you, point that you listen to most vocalists and you're like, I'm, I'm sure you're probably friends with these great musicians, but why are you in this band? Yep. God. Yep, it's a waste. It's a deal breaker yep. so much of the time. Totally. So... Like So Blinded by Fear is a perfect example of that starting to work its way out the right way to where everything sounds in balance. Um, now, the Disfear song, Live the Storm, that actually is a Kurt Ballou produced one too, that whole record. Um, and that, you know, as you mentioned, that's the vocalist from At the Gates, and that's the guitarist from Entombed. So now we're kind of like doing this like, okay, we're going to take two like godfathers of a tiny genre of music already and then like shove them together into the tiniest form of a super group that's ever existed. And it's not uh, quite what you would expect from yeah. that on paper, which is so great. Yeah. They would call themselves crust punk, mm -hmm. strangely enough. Um, you know, it sounds enough like the songs that come before it for you to hear the lineage pretty clearly. Um, but yeah, like starting to branch out and using, again, you have to be in this context to appreciate the differences between the genres, but these people definitely did. So this was new territory, uh, to be using the guitar in this, uh, or the HM2 in that context. And then I, I wanted to bring in Bloodbath because I also wanted to bring in the other side of like, this is the most death metal-y of all the death metal type songs on this list at all. Um, because the, the Swedish death metal thing would kind of continue to be groove oriented perpetually. Um, and I think that's probably because at the gates gave it that melodic tinge, uh, and it became so popular. Bloodbath is like, no, we're over here in like immolation territory, right? Just like lots of double bass and real slow guitar riffs and real deep vocals. But another good example of the vocals perfectly aligning with the production of everything else to where this is just like dark, blackened death metal, uh, but using the buzzsaw sound to really fill it out. And this is where it really starts to, like, like you've mentioned, occupy like a lower end of the registry, like as a unit, like the whole band kind of feels like they got pitch shifted down. Um, and, but it's, it's, it's also worth calling out this song because once you get into bloodbath in further territory, you start running out of songs that like feel good to talk about because they're <laughs> just like rough. And like, this one is a lighter example and it's still about the true story of a kid who was obsessed with being eaten alive and he paid somebody else to do it. And so the story is told from that perspective um, probably the only song you'll listen to, uh, in 2020, uh, that has the lyric suck my guts and lick my heart, <laughs> <laughs> which the first time you hear it, uh, guts and heart are not the words that pop to your mind when you're listening to it anyway. Uh, so that'll be fun. Go back and, and listen to that and try to figure out. What and this was, out. you made this point in the sampling one where with the flow and Eddie, where like you weren't really listening and then you had a like, well, hold, <laughs> hold on, let's run that back. Um, with guttural vocals, it's usually like hard to know. The music is the entree with a lot of this stuff, yeah. right? And then the lyrics are window dressing. It's just to like almost set an aesthetic, almost. But you can clearly hear in the chorus where he's like, my one desire, my only wish is to be eaten. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> uh, and that's not like the... Normally, so much metal is about being in the position of power and command and exerting the violence that I was like, hold on, did he say what I think he said? And then you go back in the first verses, I've had one desire since I was born, to see my body ripped and torn, to see my flesh devoured before my eyes, only for you I volunteer as a human sacrifice. I, it's just so counter to m most metal aesthetic, yeah. but it makes it that much more brutal. Like, this song... This is the Flo and Eddie song of this playlist. It's bonkers. Yeah. It's absolutely bonkers. I, I love that you brought that out, though, because like when when people real, will give me the, the actual chance to be like, no, give me 
120 seconds to defend metal, okay? Like, this is where I go pretty quickly because, like, what people see is the violence of it. And there's a ton of it. And a ton of it is unacceptable, okay? Uh, and like we There's talk- so much toxic masculinity and bad and all yeah. that. But yeah. if you can push through that, yeah. the good examples are so good. Yeah, and like, but like violence is a, I've described it as like violence is a motif uh, sure. that a lot of metal bands use. And they're borrowing the terms and the ideas and all that. And it may not sound like art to you, and that's fine. Like, you don't have to love it. I I think on the nose rap is misogynistic and it annoys me. Uh, But like, it's a different style of art form. And this one is a good example of like, when someone does push real directly into the violence direction, the production supports it. This would not, this would not work unless the music itself frightened you the right way. So... Yeah, so move your way through these four songs. Kind of listen to the way that the production of the HM2 gets shaped directionally. And then Bloodbath is the key one to end on because we're going to pick back up with what I think is, in my opinion, at least a more modern iteration of that style of music. This section is super easy and exciting for me because I would say a solid 1% of this podcast at this point has become a love letter to Kurt Ballou and to God City (laughs) Studio. Um, But this is a thing that only in retrospect, maybe you were on it faster than I was, but only in retrospect was I starting to appreciate like uh, the number of times that I've said all the best heavy records of the year are Kurt Blue God city record. This is a very specific and perfect cross section of what that means. Yeah. And also I'm excited to share with people that the, the two best heavy live shows I've ever seen were two of the bands in here, like for sure the best live metal band I've ever seen in my life, and I don't think it'll ever be topped, was Black Breath um, at 529, which back in that day, in I think it was 2012 when I saw them, or maybe 2011. Before they built the big room. <laughs> right. The whole room was the size of this room we're in now. Yeah. And their two, um, I don't think it was Les Paul's, but like solid body, that type of stock guitars played through HM2s yep. in the Marshall 800 stacks and a huge Ampeg bass cab um, and like a monster drum kit. Like the, the dude played a huge kick and it was 10 to 20 times the volume that should have been in a space <laughs> that size. Um, but it was Black Breath and Burning Love. Uh, featuring Chris Colahan, formerly of Cursed, now of Sect. Is Sect on this playlist? No, they're not. Yeah, okay. yeah, yes, yeah. They are. Okay. Um, 
like that that was it was July 1st of whatever year that was so it was like the peak heat of a Georgia summer it's hot as shit in this room and I had seen Andy Williams from Every Time I Die had tweeted like a month before that well Black Breath is the best band that I've ever seen live and I was like I was kind of into him at that point and then when one of your favorite band guys tweets something like that you're like well I gotta move heaven and earth to see if I agree and I did and I'm so glad I did because it's high watermark like all time top 10 for me uh RIP to the bassist of Black Breath um yeah so I'm, I'm <laughs> thank you for the digression I'm oh, very yeah. excited to dig in on this so Two, two things kind of happened in history, uh, or in the tiny version of history that we're talking about here, I guess. So t- Only two things have ever happened in history. <laughs> For me, yes, these two things. So, the, the like, HM2 grew, like, as a cultural phenomenon inside of these metal subgenres. Uh, and so, a couple of things started happening at once. One was this you know, this lineage that we're seeing of people get perpetually better at mixing music that was driven by HM2 powered guitars, uh, just continued to get better and better to the point to where like Kurt Blue became the uncontested like master of how to do this for any band. Right. Uh, but then the second thing that was happening was, so like I said earlier, the, the Japanese model of the HM2 is like, the only acceptable one to a lot of people. Uh, so naturally just like a uh, lack of availability, like pure scarcity is now like driving this up. It took me a long time to find mine and I did get it shipped from a really weird place. Well, it's kind of like if you are buying an analog receiver, the first pioneer one that was a thousand solid state Watts before it became digital amplification, yeah. Yeah. um, that gets so incredibly loud and stays clear. I mean, a good and even decent one of that sells for minimum a thousand dollars because people realized uh, it's so unique and specific in doing the thing that it does. So if you can get it, hold on to it. Yeah, Th- this is a lot like that, I think. Yeah. So, so it it increased popularity with getting this one really particular one, right? So people were paying a lot of money for it, and then you know what happens in capitalism when there's money to be made, people make things. Luckily, like in this case, like the the people who started making things tended to be the people who still care about the culture that they reside within. So people started producing. They'd be like ripping yourself off. Yeah. yeah. So they started producing boutique HM2 clones. So now people are taking, okay, give me the best parts of HM2. I know that four knobs dialed to 10 is the right tone. Now, what are the things that people are doing in the studio and live to slightly articulate that for whatever setting that you're in, right? So then people, like independent pedal makers started creating a bunch of these, which then created this kind of like virtuous cycle, right? Now, Kurt Ballou is consuming and commissioning HM2 boutique clone pedals to get used on particular records and all that. So like I have... Personally, I still have like an original serial checked Japanese HM2, but I also have two clones. So I have one of the like super limited edition Nails Tyrant clones that were made. Uh, which, that, that was a Dunwich one? Yeah. Uh, I think I, I have 31 out of 30, I believe. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, so, so I have one of those. And then I actually have, um, at this point... Uh, We'll say it's one of the bands on this list. The guy, the guy asked me who who sent it to me at the time. He actually asked me not to tell anybody about it at the time because it was like ahead of official release. <laughs> and then just to give a, a final clue, this band broke up uh, not long after that. So, but I've got an HM2 clone that's a one knob HM2 clone. So it's just a single knob, um, and it definitely doesn't do volume. Uh, and it's just called Heavy Metal Chainsaw, and it's got this perfect commissioned art piece that's on top because, like, boutique pedals look – like, they're just art pieces, you know? It's become its own – like, <laughs> just like um, just like show posters. Yeah. It's, it's become its own little art form. It, and now bands have started, like, releasing their own boutique pedals, like, as uh, Chotsky's, basically, for their new album releases, which is awesome. 
Um, so, okay. So this list, which itself could just be a killer, listen to all of these bands list. Craving Flesh by Gate Creeper, Feast of the Dam by Black Breath, Bad Knowns by Trap Them, Wide Open Wounds by Nails, Cruelty Incarnate by All Pigs Must Die, and Day for Night by Sect. So just kind of like... I, I want to want to show some of the directionality of this stuff. The, I, I did include these bands specifically too, because not only are they HM2 driven, but a lot of them uh, arguably reside in slightly different places within metal subculture and have slightly different approaches to all of the songwriting that they do. Right. Uh, and so I put gate creeper up first, honestly, because I wanted people to hear bloodbath into gate creeper. Because the kind of the the guttural yeah, lower awesome. bottomed out tone is kind of carried through, but you can hear it even more in modern production now. Kind of on the other side of the loudness wars, yeah. um, we hear just like a more pristine quality of the same dreadful sounding, like scary stuff. Um, and, I mean, Gate Creeper just released a heck of a record anyway, so this is an awesome song off of it. And then, like we mentioned, Feast of the Damned, which is like. The, you know, if there's going to be a, a gang vocals part for me and you that like impromptu, if we ever find ourselves with the song playing on the jukebox, this is going to be the song where we both start yelling wherever we are. That's there. So the record before it, Heavy Breathing, is more of a like, uh, I don't want to scare anyone, like a, a dark incantation type of record, right? There, there's a seance on the cover of that one. But then this one is like a hammer a uh, fist holding a hammer and punching it through glass. Um, and it's their like biker record almost. It's definitely like a leather jacket record. There's a song later on the record called the flame. That is that, that the, the riff that leads out of the flame is my number one all time favorite metal riff. Um, but there's, there are no bad riffs on really any of these whole records, yeah. but for sure on that black breath record. Um, and you're right. It is, it's different aesthetics. They all they all have very different things that they do um, as bands. But you could put any three of them together on a bill, and it would work perfectly. But you also wouldn't yeah. get bored, even though there's so much overlap in the in the kind of tone, because it is it is how they articulate it. It's it's kind of just the the approach and the headspace of the guitarist in each of these bands. Yeah. And starting with Black Breath, you start to hear when the drummer actually lets the guitar kind of take over in a way that on paper wouldn't sound like it's going to work out. But Black Breath especially, you know, they'll drop back and just start like tinging the cymbals a little bit and just like let this monster riff ride out all by itself. And so then out of Black Breath into Trap Them, like the king of HM2 riffs being left alone, just hanging out in space, being interesting themselves. Um, like this one is a perfect song to show you how this pedal contributes to a sound that's dynamic without changing volumes. Right. Like Trap Them can just somehow, the, the same way that Jimmy Page would take, I can't believe I'm making this comparison, but Jimmy Page would take a Les Paul and wouldn't change too much necessarily about anything he was playing through, but would pull back and play so gently in the, with his fingers, like on Since I've Been Loving You. Like the way he goes from the beginning of that song into the riffs themselves is more about the attack of his own playing yeah. than it is about changing effects or, you know, boosting anything. And like to me, that's that's trapped him. Uh and that's the whole style of this being able to like get that, I guess what would be called death and roll sound. And that's at least what Kurt called it. Um, I, I think it's an apt description because it's another example of like the drummer pulling back and doing less effectively to let the riff stand on its own. Um, but, uh, and they've had some of the best heavy drummers in that band. Um, oh yeah. Especially the guy that, that played on the record before this, um, darker handcraft. But I think the thing that I would call out about this block, but especially epitomized by trap them is you don't hear a lot of it in the earlier stuff, but, uh, feedback, like harsh, the harsh feedback that this pedal sound creates. And when you get better amps and kind of a meteor sound, yeah. You get harsh feedback, but it also sounds really cool. And Trap Them bookends a lot of their songs 
like intro and outroing with like a what? Yeah. And it's really, really gnarly. Yeah. Um, and it's a different sort of cutting uh, buzzsaw type attack, almost like you're firing up the saw. Uh, but they, that band uses it. Um, Brian Izzy is the guy's name, the guitarist's name, uses it to like pitch perfect yep. effect. Yep. Uh, and uh, for what it's worth, like, Straight from Kurt from conversations several years ago when I was trying to learn about this stuff. Um, but he talked about how, like, I was kind of asking, like, how does the HM2 like play into this stuff? Like, how do you get these different variations? Um, and he was saying for Trapton specifically, it's just an Ampeg V4, basically, like, and he said mixed with something else. Like, obviously, he's not, don't give me a hundred percent of your secret sauce over email to some guy you've never met. Um, but like playing it through a cleaner amp or like a, a pedal platform, so to speak, where like you're not actually doing much other than ensuring you're amplifying exactly what's coming out of the pedals before them, right. as opposed to adding another layer of distortion or gain or anything. Um, and you can st- you can really hear that and trap them. Like they're they're really just boosting through whatever the HM2 is playing. Um, but then as you start to move then into nails, now you've got a slightly different subgenre of metal and like wide open wounds has to be here. Cause like you should just know about the song period if you love heavy music. Um, but like, you know, they have a little bit more, it will like, make you want to put your own head through drywall. I mean, it in goes, a good way, in a, <laughs> in a like, because you can way it's, it is the Hulk smash of riffs. Good. God, that song is so good. Yeah. And like you can, this is going to kind of sound ridiculous unless you listen to the music, but like Trap Them almost uses the tone in a way that starts to sound almost like a a gargle, like in the background where it's, it's got its own kind of guttural quality. Um, And then Nails like makes it brighter. Like it's got a lot more attack the whole time. Um, And you can really, I mean, honestly, like as a guitar nerd, you can hear that bear itself out in there, you know, that custom tyrant pedal that was made where it's in HM2, but like we've tweaked the EQ a little bit to be really specific to this. Um, But Kurt also said for Nails, they're using a brighter amp, like a Marshall JMP 800 or 5150, blended with an HM2 into a metal zone, straight into the board, no amp sim. So just like... uh, totally different ways of producing the same things. Uh, but like all centered around, like how do we draw out different aspects of HM2 to make it suit the super heavy music. And for nails, it's a little bit more crusty in the traditional sense. And like you mentioned D beat earlier and stuff. Mm-hmm. So like they're a little bit more on the punk side anyway, their songs are, you know, often a minute, two minutes long. Um, and so it's got this bright, crisp attack uh, and yeah, just create something totally different. Uh, by the time we get to all pigs must die, uh, I pick cruelty incarnate for a couple of reasons. Like one, it's just cause the beginning riff is sort of like, what if black Sabbath played through an HM2, which I really dig. Uh, but it, it builds and starts to bring in more of that kind of traditional converge sound. And then by the end of the song, like they're playing black metal yeah. basically. Um, but you know, speaking of Brian Izzy, like he play he's playing on this record in all pigs must die. Uh, and just another super HM2 driven record that sounds definably different from the ones that came before it. Uh, and then lastly from sect, um, who's just an incredibly good punk band. Um, and I'm just, uh, I'll throw out the bit of trivia because I hope it'll serve as a hook to get you to listen to this awesome band. But the drummer is the drummer from fallout boy. Um, uh, but like their records rule, I saw them live. They ruled like it was just I remember texting you and just like, it's so nice just to see a punk band again. Mm-hmm. It, no, no premise, no like pretense, just like we're out here. We play the songs. We don't talk to you too much. Now we're done. Drink beer, have fun. Um, and so it, it's a great example though of like, they're not a band that would fit in the category with trap them or black breath necessarily. They're a vegan straight edge, like militant political yeah. hardcore punk band. Yeah. Uh, and, and still, HM2 came, drives it. That came about because Andy Hurley was filling in on drums with Earth Crisis. That's and right. So that was kind of the origin point of it. Um, and you can see it in their like in their merch, in their T-shirts. You can read it in their lyrics. They have a very different sensibility than the other bands, and part of that comes from Chris Colahan, who is like is such a badass dude. Um, but part of it really does come from Andy Hurley. I was in that camp where, like, again, every time I die, connection 
Keith Buckley. Um, they played like a Fall Out Boy played a club show. Keith Buckley got up and sang Walk by Pantera with them. And I was so pissed. I was like, how dare Fall Out Boy? I was one of those people. And I was like, dude, they were all in punk bands before this, before <laughs> they were like, let's actually make money. Um, but Andy Hurley has stayed so true. He was in some other pretty heavy band too, wasn't he? Um, I, I don't forget what it was. Yeah, but Sect is, it, but Sect is the it, one that matters. He's, yeah. he's kept the, the cred kind of the whole way. I'm glad you said that. Like that whole, actually Fall Out Boy, I don't like the music they made, but they all came from great bands before that. And, and they're an objectively good, like I give them their due. You know, yeah. it's not my thing, but it's like, oh, I get it. And just knowing that they have that background is like, all right, you guys are fine by me. Yeah. So, yeah. So, here we're going to then launch out in the next section with like all the different places that kind of get their influence and energy from this kind of subculture that I think Kurt and God City Studios is helping to create and perpetuate. The only way I know to jump into this last block is to remind you of the time, I think the only time that you and I have seen Sun together. Um, Sun, who draws out notes for as long as possible, had Dead in the Dirt open for the, um, the, the wife of one of the members of Dead in the Dirt was our wedding photographer. And she was taking us in her car to get some photos like right after the ceremony. And she had on behemoth in the car. And I just thought she was like a, a really cool and talented tattooed girl. And I was like, holy shit. She has amazing taste in music too. Um, and I don't remember how it wound up coming up, but she was like, Oh yeah. Uh, Blake is in this band. 
uh, Dead in the Dirt. And this had been like years since yeah. we had been to that Sun show. And I was like, oh, they're the band that played the like 15 second songs. They were so sick. Um, but they had that cool album cover with like the void. Oh yeah. On it. Um, and they were my, they were my entry point into grind into this like really shorter blastier stuff. Um, so yeah, let's, let's talk about this last section. If you missed daughter to get into grind, like, I feel like a lot of us were just like, Oh, we'll go with there. Like, (laughs) yeah. So like this last four, um, are to me are Good examples of, again, the the branches that kind of go out from the sound that God City is creating um, and still show the HM2 drive behind how production can sound, but are kind of taking them in their own direction. So, yeah, Dead in the Dirt, like the reason I picked up Pitch Black Tomb, although this is not uh, not a describer limited to this song on this record, but like they stop on a dime at like 30 seconds in just stop start. And like, again, such a, an awesome example of like guitar tone is really hard to manage in situations like that. And like, that's part of I, what, what must have felt like magic for HM2 stuff. Just like, I don't know where this came from, but the articulation works and you can just stop and move in a different direction. And then, you know, basically 45 seconds later be done and move on to the next thing. We've said what we need to say. The older I get, the more I just want to be in a band that only plays minute-long songs so our set can be done in 15 minutes and I can go home <laughs> and sleep. Uh, so after that is a band that's totally different uh, from Dead in the Dirt, uh, or at least to a metalhead. Uh, so Rotten Sound has a lot more death influence than Grind, but still is kind of in between those two worlds. Uh, super dirty sounding in terms of tone, but like Rotten Sound is like a proud HM2 using band. Like they've got an HM2 pedal t-shirt with Rotten Sound on it. They've got one that says um, Heavy Metal Chainsaw or something like that on it with Rotten Sound on it. So so like they love, like they embrace the culture of the HM2. Um, and it just... Honestly, an awesome band already known uh, in their part of the world. I forget the specific country, but like they're known for just being one of the best live acts where they come from anyway. Um, So Rotten Sound's another direction you can go in totally. Um, And then I wanted to bring in Enabler. All Hail the Void is awesome. Also has Andy, had Andy Hurley in it. Did not know that. (sighs) Yeah, so that was the first time that I was like, okay. Oh shit, the Fall Out Boy guy is tight. He's prolific. He's super. He's a super good drummer. Good God. Uh, so he's also in the damn things, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so enabler here. Now this is great. Enabler is using an HM2 the way that Mayhem did, uh, in the way that some of the more traditional ones are, where they're using it in combination with a modded DS1, um, like Entombed would would do during Left Hand Path as well. Um, and so like they're combining it dynamically. And it, it works here. Like, it sets them apart in in this song and on this record in general, being more of like the almost post hardcore ish, I think. Uh, but it, it just it sets them apart from anyone else who would be their contemporaries in that subgenre. But also, they don't sound like any of the other like death type or inspired bands that we had talked about before. So again, just like a good, nice, long, drawn out hardcore song to really pull out on this. Um, and then the the final one, uh, which I, I love to end on this one really specifically from the band End, which is probably one of our shared favorite heavy bands right now that's putting out new music. Um, that The new record came out this year, right? Yeah, for sure. It's been insufferably long right. year. Um, yeah, I love Will Putney as a producer yeah. and didn't learn until this record came out that he was in this band or yeah. is in this band. And I thought they were cool until I learned that fact. And then I was like, all right, I'm all in. But th- I mean, this record absolutely destroys. It's so fucking good. Yeah, because he's, he's in Fit for an Autopsy yeah. and the story was like he started writing music that he immediately felt like... Mm, not quite for the band that I'm in right now and started going this angle. Uh, But Every Empty Vein is the song that this playlist ends on. And I love it because up until this point, I've tried to choose songs that show you the articulation of the HM2. And as you hinted at earlier, Trap Them would often 
bookend their songs with like wild feedback uh, or just like kind of letting it out of control and then ramping it in, doing the song and then going back out. This song is like the guitar is ready to bust out of itself the entire time. It barely hangs on. Um, and to me, it reminds me of like, I guess the last time we saw Converge, there was a moment in the middle of the set where they got to Dark Horse and the guitar started sounding like it's like he's going to lose control of the guitar tone. Like the feedback was starting to come up to the same level as the guitar playing itself. And it felt like its own presence. Like it felt like the tone needed to be like dealt with. And this song to me is a great example of like how the HM2 actually plays when you're just playing it regularly. It's insufferable sounding because actually like what you're hearing on a produced sound is like, really articulate noise gating and like trying to pack in the sound really specifically. It's like somebody put a shrapnel bomb in a box. Yeah. And, like it doesn't work without the cage around it. Yeah. yeah. But like you just have your guitar playing nothing and you turn on the HM2. It's like, yeah. And just, it doesn't end until you start playing and it has input. And like, this is such a Which great is, I song. I mean, it's like sure. riding a dragon almost. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. It's, it's going to absolutely lay waste to everything in its path until you're like all right let's do this shit. exactly so that's why i wanted to end on that one because like it really shows that there's this whole other kind of end of the spectrum uh and possibly even parts of the pedal yet to be discovered and used on purpose um that are showing up in this end record which quite frankly is like this this band is at the forefront of hardcore along with in my opinion code orange a number of other bands like that who are finding the edges of the genre and trying to bring kids along with them and just find the right places to push um and so this one is awesome and like i just love again the the constant balance of like the HM2 only works if you dial it all the way to 10. Like, it's a cheap pedal used in a really specific way. Uh, it's really expensive now because you can't find too many of them because they were cheap and they stopped making them. Like, it's both ends of the spectrum kind of at the same time. Uh, and it, it was just, you know, talking about, like, how to ride a dragon, like, figuring out how to deal with it until people started being able to consistently reproduce that sound and then people just wanted to keep using it. Like, I mean, this literally, this pedal has driven enough. I could live on a desert island made like it with only records made with an HM2 driven guitar pedal. <laughs> like, I mean, it's it's wild how much it blossomed. Yeah, you're out. not even remotely kidding. That's the best part. I'm, yeah, yeah, not even a little. Um, but like, it's such a great example of just like the, the art in heaviness, the things that I think that we appreciate coming out of just pure like utility from kids in the middle of nowhere who knew nothing. Um, and like, to me that that's why I've really enjoyed our kind of like macro and micro journeys on these playlists. Cause like, it's not just about being nerdy or oddly specific to me. Like there's so much beauty in like somewhere in the world, some teenager turned this pedal all the way up to 10 and had the first thought of like, I think I'm going to leave it this way on purpose and then like produce this musical progeny basically of all this incredible music that would come to be actually inspired by the guitar tone that you could create. Like to me, that's, that's magic. Like that's the stuff I show up for every day. So I'm, I'm glad I finally got to do this playlist. Thanks for doing it with me. I'm very glad too. And I, if we get one, one tweet or Instagram DM that somebody was like, I wasn't really into heavy music before this, but this is some of the tightest and most unusual stuff I've ever heard. Or just like one song on this changed my day. And I think I might like heavy music now. I think both of us could die happy. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and I might.